part of a programme called Sculpting Time, um, which is um, a retrospective touring programme um, of the films of Andrei Tarkovsky, um, all seven of which have been um, restored, and they're showing in these brand new uh, restored versions as part of a, a nationwide um, programme of cinema screenings, which began in May, but is still ongoing. So if you haven't um, managed to catch any of them yet in the cinema, um, there is still someone at the Regent Street Cinema in London. Um, and they're also available on, online if they're via Curzon Home Cinema. So if you're here, if you've come out on this incredibly hot night, um, you're probably already quite committed to um, Tarkovsky, and uh, I'm sure you know uh, quite a lot about him already, so I won't sort of do a full biography. Um, just to say that, uh, in, case you, in case you don't know, born in 1932 in Russia, um, he made seven feature films before his death in 1986. And these complex, um, met metaphysical and often highly personal films were widely acclaimed throughout Europe, um, although they were often less well-received and often in some cases actually uh, suppressed or only limited released um, through the sort of Soviet censorship. And he made his last, few, last two films, Nostalgia and the Sacrifice in Italy and, and Sweden. But since his death, he's obviously been recognised um, in Russia as well as throughout the world as one of the great Russian artists. And his work continues to inspire not, not only filmmakers, um, but I think also visual artists and increasingly sound, um, sound artists and, and musicians and writers. So tonight I'm really pleased to chair this discussion which focuses on one of the aspects of Tarkovsky's films that has always fascinated me, um, and I think as it does many other people, and that's the unique sonic and musical environments of his films. This is an aspect of filmmaking that Tarkovsky himself um, paid great attention to, and I think inevitably, given his preoccupation with, with ideas around time and memory, both of which are expressed in sound particularly effectively. Um, in his book, Sculpting in Time, he writes of the importance of music um, in creating an emotional aura rather than as he calls it, a flat illustration of what's going to happen on the screen. And yet he also talks about the idea of going beyond music. Um, he says that if a, f a film is ideally fully realised, it, it could and it should actually have no music at all. And he says, I quote, um, it may be that in order to make the cinematic image sound authentically, music has to be abandoned. And he says it can be replaced by sounds in which cinema constantly discovers new levels of meaning. And I think when we listen, as well as, listen to as well as watch films such as Stalker and Mirror um, and Nostalgia, you, you hear this put into practice. Sound, like what Tarkovsky calls the resonant world, um, it becomes the music of the film. And these, so these are intensely musical films, but they're also films in which the idea of music is challenged and expanded for the listener. Um, so uh, the, the artists and writers that I've... Um, very pleased to have on the panel here tonight. Um, they've selected some um, excerpts from various films, which I think will provide some interesting starting points for discussing some of these, these ideas. Um, so I'd just like to, to introduce tonight's panelists, and then we can maybe start watching, watching some stuff. Um, so um, Trevor Matheson here is a, an artist and composer who works mainly with electronic sound. Uh, one of the founders of the Black Audio Film Collective, he continues to work closely with um, the filmmaker John O'Confra, and in 2012, they collaborated on the installation at the graveside of Tarkovsky, for which Trevor made the soundtrack. Um, this is Sam Davis. Uh, Sam's a writer who writes about music and film for um, The Wire and Sight and Sound magazines. He's currently um, the columnist at Sight and Sound who does the Soundings column, which is a monthly column that um, looks at music and sound on film. Uh, Juliet Jakes, here on my, my left, um, is a writer and critic who has written for The Guardian, Freeze, um, LRB, and um, the film magazine Vertigo. Her book, Trans, a memoir, was published last year on Verso. So a really great panel. Thanks, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, so as I said, we... we um, we asked everybody to uh, select some excerpts from films. And I thought maybe we could start um, with one of those straight off. Um, and I'd like to start with the one that Trevor chose. Um, Trevor chose um, an excerpt from the film Stalker, which was made in 1979. Trevor, do you want to talk a little bit about the clip, or would you rather we saw the clip first and then talked about it? After, 
Afterwards will be good, yeah. Okay, so if we could watch Trevor's clip. And this is um, it's the opening of uh, Stalker.
So Trevor, why did you why did you choose that excerpt? Because it best represents the certain concerns that we have or I have in the um, making sound pieces and in for the film. Yeah. yeah. The the I love the flute playing at the beginning part and then even to when we cut to the the sound of the the train. Mm. So I like the idea that you can have the composed pieces and then these other individual sounds that are blended together to make a, to create an atmosphere. Even from the squeaking of the floorboards to doing the zip to the light bulb, everything's heightened. So the, the atmosphere has been set up. There's like a, a aroma been right. laid down in, in, in some pieces. So that's why I chose this one. Do you remember? When, I mean, when did you? Do you remember when you first saw that film, and, and whether it's had an effect on you? Is it just something that you you kind of? The thing is, I think yeah. I probably watched it, seen it in college or when I left college, mm. and the other members of the group would have seen it, and we would have spoken about that. And I'm only now realising how much the the structure of the sound is very similar to to my approach. And what is it that's similar in? in would you um, say in that in that? In the film, it feels that he's, he's pulled away the, the natural sound and replaced it with another layer of sound. So everything's been heightened, like footsteps have been added. So yeah. like there's yeah. a, a, a ripping out of the natural space sound and replacing it with a, a, a heightened sound again. But also the way of the music being made up of different um, sort of elements, but even... Because I was watching, I was thinking, is the sound in the space, or is it like an internal uh, sonic experience as the camera pans across? Because you hear some sort of classical music being played, so it's like, is it inside an internal um, musical note, or is it the sound of the, the, the room vibrating? So, you know. Yeah, and it's never, I mean, yeah. you, that's up to you to decide, isn't it? Which I think is something that's, that's really exciting and I think probably for you as an artist as well really interesting it's quite it's quite a liberating idea isn't it that you can present sound in the film and it doesn't have to be clear where it's from it yeah. doesn't have to it can it's, be mysterious it's it's because it's like a you know I keep saying it's a bit like using lego bricks you build in modules or building shapes yeah. and you're working it with the the rhythm of the the, the cinematographers and the editors so it's like a, it's a continual collaboration. So we shoot the stuff, we edit, and then we, we replace some of the sound, or you try to give a third character, which is the musical character within the within the pieces as well. So. Yeah, the idea of layering, I know, is very yeah. is very central to what to what you do. I mean, not just to create an effect, but it has a kind of philosophy and a kind of politics yeah. to it as well, doesn't it? Yeah, we are able to. Um, Get a deeper meaning into into the like literally like ghost in um, the past within the present. So you have the le sonic leakage of uh, old voices or new voices that are happening in the same frame. So you have this the room resonating with the the, the sound of past events. It's, yeah. it's a sort of like a part of it. Yeah, it's interesting, I think, that you chose Stalker because, of course, the story of that, I mean, it's very loosely based on the novel Roadside Picnic by um, Arkady and, and Boris Strugatsky, but, like, the, the sort of premise is, is that, you know, there, there is this space, the zone, you know, where there is this kind of leftover mm -hmm. stuff, um, which is, in some ways, it's malevolent. There's, like, traps, there's things that go wrong, but it's also a place where people's desires are granted in that kind of, so it's this quite powerful idea about things that are left or kind of detritus and but also sort of that, that there's something in there that, that is also very good or very I don't know it's, it's quite an evocative base again is that you could see as like a, the psychological state of uh, a country or a person so maybe it's that sort of the legacy of stuff is that it never it never ever goes away yeah. There's, after the revolution, there are still markers, there's still um, resonances of past events still in the people and, in, and marks on the land as well. So that's what I'm thinking is it's got that sort of... Um, the space is like us, because he's, he's going with two other guys to go and investigate, so there's something that's going on. But I definitely think that the, the pulling away of the natural sound makes the experience even more heightened. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like he's like he's sucked the air out of the room and then just given small local marks, and then the voice carries through 
the, the, the pieces as well. I yeah, don't. I think it really makes you aware as well of like the rhythm of, yeah. of those everyday sounds. Because it's and what using mean, you know. water, fire, wind, the, the barking of dogs, distant sounds. Mm -hmm. So you repopulate the space with different elements or um, elemental elements within that space. But then you still have this musical refrain coming back mm. through the piece again. And then you have the electronic sort of, sort of build. So it is, it, is, it is, in this one film, it has all of the elements that I use in you know, my little toolbox of stuff. Right. That's, it's all, it's That's amazing. Like, it's just contained in this, in, this, yeah. in this one excerpt as well. I mean, what, I don't know if, if, if you two want to say anything about that, that excerpt or how, yeah, well, I, I was just thinking how it works for you. You were saying about um, remnants and things that resonate, because later on he does the same layering of... Uh, the train noise and some classical music. Yeah, I think yeah. it's Bolero very late on, yeah. and that's it's as it's the transition from when they leave the zone, they come back out. I've always just thought that's a, I don't know. I've not, never really worked out why he choose Bolero, but it just <laughs> seems to work because yeah. like a... again, you, you, the colour shifts from look, this um, sepia type world, mm -hmm. and when they leave it, it's like oh, we've got back into colour now. Mm -hmm. and then you think, okay. So even that sort of shifts mm. again. So you know that you 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 are moving through states, and sound or the visual is giving you markers, but the sound also marks out the atmosphere because it does feel like it's, it's a, like a dead space. There's nothing else going on, or you may hear like a bird song or a cuckoo, or but there's nothing else. So like I think it's like when you're shooting it, you either just took out the sound and replaced it with like the foley sound or sort of sort of markers and then that made the film have a, even more of an atmosphere so you are in the sort of like um, uh, a new world you know a different sort of but it's good I think it's yeah I, I think it was I think it was all post-production sound I think um, which works really well in the zone because yeah. it has this weird it's like it, visually it's very alive but then sonically at times it's like really yeah. like dead and you're not really sure whether because everything has this, like, you know, when you're walking through water, that becomes even more bright, more yeah. in, in your face. So literally the sound of the, the environment is now being charged with energy. Mm. Yeah, there's a certain atmospheric sort of um, aroma, a sonic tone. Uh, you're no longer in Kansas, kind of. Thing. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah, sort of. yeah it's, it's funny because in some ways there is this kind of idea of it being almost... I mean, this is so not a Tarkovsky thing to say in a way, but, but there is this, this sort of sense that it has this kind of almost classical kind of Hollywood transformation. It is, you know, it's like it goes from, you know, to, to go from black and white to colour, you know, I mean, it's mm. the Wizard of Oz, right? I mean, but it's not, of course, it's not like that, but it has, it does have that element, I think, of a kind of fairy tale or fable yeah. or something where one world is, becomes another world, you know, and, and um, yeah, I think that's probably very conscious, but it's, it's done in this very unusual way. It's just stylized, it's very atmospheric um, for the... Yeah, I just think it's very, it's just a, a, a very poetic, sort of graceful um, execution, I guess. Yeah. It's just cool. Any thoughts yeah. on the, the music in, in that? I um, thought maybe it's something we could start talking about. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, the excerpt that I'm going to show in a minute does something quite similar in terms of having the sort of diegetic sounds that would be in the the room or the space, and a sort of amplifying of those by bringing in some sounds that are external, like the the train noises and the sort of transport sounds, but also um, you know some sort of subtle but increasingly strident synth sounds, electronic sounds, to sort of reinforce the kind of emotional message and the sort of atmosphere that's that's being created. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen the clip from Andrei Rublev yet, but I can already see from seeing that clip and knowing what I'm queuing up next, that there's a, a sort of formalistic and thematic unity, even though I think Solaris and Stalker are maybe kind of outliers in in Tarkovsky's output. They are, aren't they? And I think that's. I mean, I suppose one 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 way of looking at that is the very basic one that they are kind of, in a way, science fiction films. Although, of course, they're so not. They're so very different, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Well, although you know, they are from a time. 
So that's 1979, Solaris is 1972. It's a, it's a decade where science fiction is very interesting, actually. Mm. I mean, you know, even in sort of, sort of commercial science fiction is interesting at, at that time, mm. um, I think. So it's um, how they fit into science fiction is it's generally seen as like, well, you know, they're, they're, he doesn't really see them as that, and they're not really that. But actually, they are coming at a time when, you know, um, po it's post-2001, isn't it, basically? We were just talking earlier about whether or not that might have been any influence on Solaris, and we weren't sure, but... Um, well, I think in some ways, though, Stalker is almost not a science fiction film at all because all that it kind of sets up is ambiguous, the, you know, what the zone is and where it's come from, and it's this place of miracles. And you could actually, I think you could almost retitle it as, like, Shepherd, and it makes as much sense because yeah. that's kind of what he does. He doesn't actually really stalk through the zone. He kind of shepherds this mini flock, mm. you know, and they're supposed to have faith and, and believe, and they don't enough for him, and then he, you know, takes them out. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of this, the, the book is much more, what well, it's called roadside picnic for starters, but the, the idea is much more about, like, waste, you know, and the, the things that are left, like, literally just, like, what, what the aliens didn't want, like, literally just what they threw on the ground. And I think that's, it's, it's a much, the tone of, of the novel is actually more... It's quite, it's quite humorous, I think. I don't know if anyone's read it, but it's, it has a sort of... It's, it's quite playful, it's quite dark. It, de it definitely sort of plays on ideas of, of, of waste, I think, in a very interesting sort of industrial waste kind of way. And it's, it's really... Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting how that source material becomes something so completely different, actually. Um, I mean, the music... So the music for Stalker and Solaris, the, the original music, is composed by Edward Artemyev. Um, and... I think I was wondering if, if there's something to say here about like the role of electronic music in the science fiction films of this time, but also just that music generally, like the, the kind of atmosphere it, it, it creates, and where does it fit into maybe a wider context of synthesizer soundtracks? Um, yeah, I mean, what um, Tarkovsky does with the sound for Solaris is very interesting, I think, because you, you mentioned in the the quote that you read, like, Tarkovsky felt the perfect film wouldn't have any music. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to have music for Solaris. He wanted um, <coughs> Artemyev to compose or sort of create some sort of atmospheric sort of soundscapes, but not really a kind of music as such in the way it, it would be understood mm -hmm. as sort of film soundtracks at the time. And obviously, you know, we mentioned 2001 you know, something that very famously pulls in kind of Georgi Ligeti and lots of other pieces of kind of pre-composed music to very, very striking and very famous effect. And Tarkovsky, you know, couldn't have missed that. Um, and he didn't really want to do the same thing with, with Solaris. And Artemyev talked him into it. Mm -hmm. Artemyev talked him into using the, um, the choral prelude in B minor, uh, F minor, sorry, the, um, by Bach that... Uh, opens and closes Solaris and appears as a sort of motif throughout it. And he does that, um, he kind of ties the um, orchestral music to Earth. So whenever you're kind of on Earth at the start of the film, which, which isn't in Stanislav Lem's novel, mm -hmm. um, the novel is set entirely on the planet and around the planet of Solaris, and Tarkovsky uh, brought in the opening scenes on planet Earth. Um, and use the use the bark piece and the sort of arrangement of that uh, accordingly, uh, and I think it's very very successful actually. I mean, it becomes uh, uh, very powerfully associated with with the film, even though obviously it's a pre-existing mm -hmm. piece of music to the point where um, the Lithuanian film artist Diamantas Narkovicheus he made a, a film called Revisiting Solaris in two thousand and seven, uh, which sort of constructs a chapter of Lem's book, where they're on the planet, uh, that Tarkovsky leaves out, and he gets um, Donatus um, Banionis, who's the actor playing the lead role, um, to revisit his role as well. And he uses the Bach music to, to really kind of incredible effects, and really it sort of feels like that more than anything else that most strongly recalls the Tarkovsky original. So, um, you know, I think it's a really sort of happy set of circumstances that, that Artemyev was able to talk Tarkovsky around on this mm -hmm. theoretical point. Yeah, I think it also kind of reminds us that filmmaking is always a collaborative 
eventually, you know, however much we, we might talk about Tarkovsky uh, in this sort of maybe slightly reverent way as the director, the auteur, but of course the, the people he worked with, his cinematographers and, and his composer, I mean, obviously he worked with other composers a bit, but Artemiev is a very important influence, I think, on him, and, and, and it's, it's one of those sort of stories that, that, that really makes you think about how a film, you know, you can read Tarkovsky's aims for his films or what he thinks the ideal, theoretically perfect film should be, but actually in the making of that, you know, all these sort of different decisions and compromises are made, which I think is, um, is always something to kind of think about when you're talking about film music and sound, because it often can feel like a bit of a... a it's not, I mean, it's not something that's always the first thing that people think about, right, yeah. obviously, and it can seem like a kind of adjunct to the film, but there's all these instances where it's actually the, the, the composer or the sound designer or the music consultant actually plays this big part in creating the identity of, of the film, perhaps. Yeah, I, well, I think since this, it's easy to kind of forget that, you, it's very easy to talk about synths and you think of people playing keyboards and you mm-hmm. associate it with a particular kind of sound, but it's actually meant to be kind of synthesizing and making these artificial sounds. And a lot of, I mean, Oscar Salah, you know, the, the birds um, score he did, which imitated, you know, bird song and things like that. You, you could watch Stalker and not always know what you're listening to, I think. That's that kind of, there's like a groundlessness and you're not always sure. You might, you might be listening to a Foley sound effect or someone's actual footsteps or, but you'll never actually know, you know, there are sounds that are kind of in between the two. It's, it's, it's a synthesizer or it's some other kind of filtered, treated sound. Um, so, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's, I mean, it's not just the synth kind of theme that uh, Artemiev has at the beginning in, that, in the credits uh, title sequence. But it is that construction of taking different elements, the sound of a, a train, the sound of a ship, or the sort of small elements have been, been re, um, realigned mm-hmm. to create an atmosphere for a mm-hmm. scene. Yeah. Or even the walking through uh, the water, then you have, you've got the footstep sounds, but then there's other sort of low frequency sort of sounds in the background again that fills, yeah. fills that space, or when it rises and falls again. And then it's the same thing with uh, even well, when he turns the light on, you hear this sort of gas fire sort of thing. So like, there's lots of little things to draw you into the, the world. So you have to believe in the logic or the, 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 uh, the psychological state or the, the, the logic of that world that is constructed with these things. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's a, it makes the story more believable or the journey more interesting or as interesting to be, to be what questioning where things are coming from. Yeah. It, it sort of recalibrates how you listen because yeah. some of the, the sounds are so quiet and they're kind of like some micro details that you, you have to really focus in, don't you, to, to pick it all up. And I was saying to Francis, I mean, Tarkovsky would probably hate it, but it's almost like a, head, a headphone film mm. that you need to be able to block everything else out completely to pick up on all the, mm. all the time. I think details. there's a stillness to the film, or well, into, into the Stalker, definitely, like a very still yeah. atmosphere. It's like, yeah. it's literally, even the way he moves in the frame has a certain sort of like pull all the way down. Even when they're outside in the countryside, they're still thinking it's it's been the natural sounds have been pulled out and then replaced with another series of sounds again. So it is like an architecture that you're building around, um, you know, each frame which moves to the next frame, which moves the story along or moves the the character into a new uh, situation. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that's. Nice thing about that as an idea as well, it, it, it fits very well with the idea of what um, what a synthesizer is, what a synthesizer does, especially at this t- at this time in history, and also how certain effects are created. Like I always love the bit with with the train where you can just hear a lot of reverb. I mean, it's yeah. just like a plate reverb or something, but it's such a beautiful physical effect. You know, it's a very simple effect, but it does something very. I don't know. I, I, I really feel it. You know, um, and and what you were saying about the headphones. I mean. Yeah, probably in theory Tarkovsky would not like that, but he also writes in, about why he chose, or why he, why he particularly felt electronic music worked in Stalker. Um, and it's bec- one of the reasons is because it has this interior quality, because it kind of suggests an interior na- narrative, like you were saying, is, it, is, is someone hearing this in their head? Is it, is it over there? Is it, you know, like, so he felt that 
pure sort of like electronic tones and electronic manipulation, they suggest that because they don't have like they're not um, automatically like illustrative of something in the real world, right? Mm. So uh, they actually so so maybe the headphones film is not such a bad. But the, idea. the, the, the <laughs> twist is when you play uh, like a folk song within mm. the piece again, and that throws up another layer of um, experience because it's, it's it's now grounded in some historical or um, regional kind of phrase thing. I think. I think when there's some like little folk songs or folk sounds that are sort of really mixed in, and you think, okay, and it's blended with the other sounds as well. It's quite. Kind of yeah, and certain kind of melodies and modes yeah. as well, which suggest, if, even if they don't literally you know, imply, but they, they suggest something that has a place or it has a region, but we don't know what that is. We never really find out, you know. Yeah, um, and I think just the, the nature of the um, equipment being used... Uh, the sort of ANS synthesizer that um, Evgeny uh, Merzin um, invented actually just before the Second World War and sort of perfected in the 50s. Uh, so a lot of the composers, particularly Artemiev, were people who would have worked with um, non-electronic uh, instruments for most of their careers and were kind of intrigued by this new technology, but they weren't, you know, they weren't exclusively electronic Musicians in the way that you know, even some people in kind of the U.S. and Britain would have been by the by the 60s. Um, hence, I think this sort of approach that we're talking about of kind of merging kind of natural sounds, um, you know, sort of classical or baroque or other kind of pre-electronic composition, and uh, and the possibilities for the new technology, um, and of course, you know, Solaris and and Stalker are made at a time when sort of electronic music is still very much the future. Um, and there's a sense of that sort of, I think, excitement about the possibilities of this technology that comes through in, in both of those soundtracks. Yeah, it's a time when that kind of ele electronic music is, is still... I mean, it's a style, there is a style, but it's it hasn't quite kind of crystallised into, I guess, cliché. And, and also the ANS... Um, synthesizer. I mean, it's really, it's really, really unusual, isn't it? I mean, it's very, it, it's pretty unique. Um, it's an optical synth, right? So it works with with light, right? and, and so it's closest to. I mean, it's like a sort of successful version of the Daphne or Am, you know, or Amix machine or something like that. But it's a very, it's a very unusual device as well, right? Which which uses visual information to make sounds. Yeah, and they're sort of printed on like five discs, which I think in total can hold something like 720 microtones. So you've got, you know, quite a big sort of sonic palette, but one that's still small enough for people to really master, I think. Um, yeah, uh, and there's, there's a compilation around of, of kind of early electronic music from Russia made with the ANS synth from the mid-60s to the early 70s. And yeah, most of those composers only worked with that instrument um, sporadically or occasionally, or I think one of them, Alfred Schnitker, only once. Yeah. And there's a piece on there called Steam, which uh, I think is a really incredible piece of, of purely electronic music, but it was the only electronic piece that Schnitker made. Right, yeah. I mean, I think there was also very limited access to electronic instruments at that time for most people in, in the world, but I think particularly... In Russia, I mean, the ANS is, is, yeah. There's like a whole another sort of little history there that that is is fascinating to read about, like how it's created as this this futuristic instrument. It's the national synthesizer of Russia, you know. I mean, which is which is funny. Um, Every country should have a national yeah, exactly. synthesizer. Right? <laughs> and it's and it, it it lives in the Skriabin Museum, um, you know. It's it's very and and then and then eventually people just kind of forget about it, and the studio that it's in starts to get used by slightly more countercultural people mm. and, and Artemiev is there throughout the whole story which is really nice I think he, he, he goes with it and um, so yeah it's, it's, it, it's, it, I think the, yeah, there's like a, a really interesting history there of like technology being used and not exactly misused but used in unusual ways actually yeah I mean you, you also get the feeling in that clip from Stalker I think that you know Artemiev has been working at a time when John Cage's ideas are in the ascendancy and, and you know, the sort of aleatoric elements to the soundtracks, I think. 
Yeah, no, uh, of course. Yeah, it's, um, well, I mean, those ideas, I don't know how much they transmitted to, to Russia, but I would imagine enough mm. by that time. That I think people were. who were that interested in music would have been, yeah. have been aware. Yeah. Um, shall we have a look at, at your clip from Solaris now? Sure. We sort of seem to have moved towards Solaris um, and talking of, talking of the um, ANS and Artemiev. So, um, again, do you want, should we just watch it and then we can yeah. talk? Yeah. Sense, yeah. Okay, so can we watch uh, clip number two? So this is from Solaris, which was made in 1972. Yeah.
I mean, this, this particular clip uh, comes about half an hour into the film, and the first time I saw it, it was kind of the moment where the film went from being something... I thought, yeah, this is quite interesting. I think I'll stick with it to being, yeah, kind of transfixed by it. And really, the moment where I sort of lost myself in the film and nothing else mattered, so I think it helped that I, um, I watched it. I started watching it about midnight on a, a summer night in 2003 after working a shift at Gatwick Airport. Um, <laughs> so it felt sort of particularly appropriate, you know, the sort of alienation of that um, that sort of urban industrial uh, sort of society that it shows, you know, I mean, the sort of area around Gatwick is, is sort of similar. It's got the sort of J.G. Ballard uh, sort of feel to it. Um, that's the moment that really dragged me in. I mean, the, the character you see, uh, Henri Burton, um, he has been on the, the mission to Solaris and he has come back very traumatised and um, you've just been introduced to uh, Chris Kelvin, the, um, the psychologist who's involved with the mission and uh, him and uh, Burton and Kelvin have watched a video of a, a really harrowing press conference that Burton has delivered. Um, uh, in very sort of um, a sort of post-traumatic sort of tones where he's struggling to talk about what happened but talks about seeing a child on the surface of, of Solaris who we hadn't expected to see. Um, and Kelvin doesn't believe him basically and uh, he's, he's very, very um, obviously really shattered that Kelvin doesn't believe him and so you see him driving away from Kelvin's house and the way the... Um, you know, that, that very, very long scene of, of, of just uh, Bert on driving. I mean, most other filmmakers, you know, you're, you're told in filmmaking um, textbooks or classes, you know, get your characters from A to B as quickly as possible. But Tarkovsky builds so much sort of uh, intensity and sort of drama into just the solo voyage of, of Bert on. You don't even really know where he's going, I don't think. Um, and I was just blown away by it. So there's a really incredible scene and what I really like about the sound in this scene is um, is obviously the way it starts off in, in near total silence and just gradually the um, the sounds that are just inherent to the, the scene come in so you get the the noise of, of his car and then all the other cars uh, and then that very quietly building up of the um, yeah the sort of the electronic noise that Artemiev has created you get that very quietly coming through, uh, you know, very much in sync with the, the building traffic noises, uh, which also ties into the way that Tarkovsky sort of just flips from this sort of blue tint monochrome to, to colour. Um, and, and both of those things give you a sort of sense of the dislocation, the sort of confusion uh, and the alienation that, that the character is experiencing. Um, I just think it's an incredibly striking scene. Yeah, that, that's, it's, it's really nice to hear it described like that in so much detail because um, when I was just thinking about this talk and I was, I was looking, looking up a few things about the excerpts that you chose and one thing that made me laugh a bit was if you, if you kind of do some internet research about that particular scene, you get all these quite funny comments on like YouTube or whatever. People say, why is that? Why is that? Like, as, if, as, if it, as if it really helps to ask why in a Tarkovsky film. I mean, it doesn't really help, does it? Like, why? I don't know. But they're like, why is there that really... I love Solaris, but there's that really long highway bit in the middle. What is that all about? And Never read YouTube comments. No, I mean, obviously, it's a silly idea, but I mean... Makes The Guardian um, look like Tell Kell or something. It's incredible. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, it does have this sense of, like, it's out of place. It's out of yeah. time, and yeah. it's... And there it is, but actually, of course, it does have this. There is a, there is a real purpose to it, and it's incredibly important yeah. to the film, actually. And it, but it works so well standalone as well. I mean, it could easily be the videos like a Kraftwerk or a Radiohead track, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, it does. It feels like a, a short film, perhaps in, in itself. Yeah. And the, the, the funny thing about it is that it's. He, he, I mean, how long is that sequence? About about five, five minutes. minutes. Five, so he spends five minutes with this guy in the driverless car going home. Um, when Chris Kelvin flies, you know, mm. from one uh, planet, you know, to to another, uh, that happens in like 20 seconds or something, doesn't it? It's, it's a really, it's it almost like it stands in, like, you know, like, he can't effectively do the rocket sequence, the tra the, the mm. interplanetary travel sequence. So he, he does this, it's like his inner space thing, you know, like 
going from point A to point B in the modern world is almost like its own, um, you know, kind of trippy experience. Um, but the, the tension is built is building up as you're yeah. going along, and then it's balanced off by when it cuts. Yeah, it just like the sound just drops away. That cut's then, extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you have that yeah. sort of again, the tension is building inside mm -hmm. this guy. Then it's like the release. Yeah. It's quite. And the, the release and the sound, like you say, the sound completely disappears. Yeah. And obviously, we cut to the scene of kind of real, natural, tranquil. Yeah. Um, so you know the the synchronization between the visual and the sonic elements, both formally and the thematically, I think is it's astonishingly precise and considered. Um, and you can see its influence. Um, on plenty of filmmakers since, I think. I mean, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Bellatar, who, um, much like Tarkovsky, had a preferred composer, was uh, Mihaly Vig. And um, obviously, Bellatar is famous for thinking nothing of, of having, ag again, you know, if you're talking about characters getting from A to B as quickly as possible, you know, most characters, most filmmakers would have somebody say there's something happening in town and you'd immediately cut to the town. Whereas Bellatar will have the bloke drink most of his pint on his own. Someone come into the bar and say something's happening in town and then the bloke will finish the pint at his own leisure. <laughs> and then you'll get the whole 10 minute walk into town. Um, but it'll be brilliant. It'll be better than like any, I mean the opening scene of Satan Tango has an astonishing soundtrack uh, by Mihaly Vig, again, very similar sort of electronic sort of or electroacoustic y sort of feeling, um, slowly building up this really ominous atmosphere. And it's, it's just cows. It just cuts from cow to cow to cow in this Hungarian landscape. And I was told it was 20 minutes long, that opening shot. And I watched Satan Tango recently. It's only eight minutes long. And I was really disappointed. I wanted to. <laughs> go back to my friend and said, look, you told me that cow scene was 20 minutes, it's only eight, and I didn't want it to end. Maybe it felt, um, it felt like and I could have watched a lot more of, of that traffic scene as well. I could have easily watched another, like, 10 or 15 minutes of that. Um, I could. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there's, like, a long car crash in, in Goddard's Weekend where you just you follow this incredibly long traffic shot, um, tracking shot along this, this like, traffic jam. Um, I think there's a real kind of beauty and sort of dignity and subtlety to those shots. It's really strange actually because it's also exit music because that character is then out of the film. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah. So he gets this extraordinary kind of send off. He's, yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, you know, what happens to him psychologically, of course, is, is something that I think is in the back of your mind as a viewer for the rest of the film. So, you know, this man has clearly been utterly broken by this mission. What, what happens to the other characters? What happens to him? Yeah, I think that idea of staying with some, something or someone is very integral to a lot of Tarkovsky's films. This idea of duration and long duration is kind of, it's almost like a kind of responsibility in some ways to, to, the, to this character, I, I, I'm sure. But it's, I think, um, yeah, I mean, duration is something perhaps that is a theme that, that recurs throughout, not just like staying visually, but also sort of st get, staying with something long enough that you really listen. It seems like you're staying longer than you need to. Yeah. It exactly. seems that, I, I, and then it just goes on, then something else may happen, or it just cuts, and you're off into another location again, or another scene. But it, again, but it's building uh, attention in us. It's doing something to our we expect film to, mm. to, to go, but it, I think that's what it's I mean, doing. Solaris, um, yeah, you know, I watched it all in one sitting and then I actually watched it again a few weeks later. Um, I watched it with my dad. Um, my dad had walked out of uh, a home screening of Renoir's La Regle de Jeu a couple of weeks earlier after about an hour and I thought, what better to win him back than a 160-minute <laughs> uh, Soviet science fiction film. But um, we were both really sort of transfixed by it and it does utterly justify its length. Um, but, but more through, yeah, use of sort of sound and, um, and cinematography rather than the plot. Um, I haven't actually seen the Steven Soderbergh remake, which is sort of half the length. And I'm told it's not bad, actually. It's, I'm told it's, it's, it's no, it's, uh, it doesn't lose too much from taking a sort of different approach and a much shorter approach.
Does it have a four minute taxi drive? I don't think it has the four minute taxi drive. Um, well, I think it's in, in, in excerpts like that where you, you see the influence of Tarkovsky not just on cinema but on, on kind of artists, film and video as well. Mm. I mean, I don't, that's probably something that, that you can comment on, Trevor, I think. Um. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to. Once, no, once seen, uh, not for easily forgotten. Mm. One thing that mm. is different. Um, mm. It leaves. A, that's what I was saying before. Like there's, um, it's like a ghost that's ever present. Mm -hmm. But every now and again, you get glimpses of it in, in the room, and it affects how you approach <laughs> your own work. Um, again, like we're saying, the, the tracking, well, the, the long shot, because there is a mesmeric kind of feeling when you're looking at the coloured lights of the cars, and it's either slightly speeded up. And yeah, again, that's all. Yeah, yeah. So there's, um, there is that, and there's, obviously there's the shifting of colour. That moves, moves around. So yeah. I think the thing it makes me think of as well is, um, is the kind of video or film that you'd see in installations. Mm. It, it suggests to me that very clearly that that it could also another way of looking at it would be sort of multi-screen. But or you, like even the track itself, like if you you could actually put a beat underneath that. Mm. Yeah, it has, that it has a, a sort of suggestive. Well, the, sort of the way that the composed elements become, by the end of that scene, they have become the dominant aspect yeah. of the sound, whereas you know they, they start off very much subservient to the sort of traffic noises. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I think you could do something very interesting by adding... Because I thought I could like, hear like, you know, like in your backwards um, tape, when you play it backwards, you get the, the walking backwards, mm -hmm. there's either pieces in there, or even like loops. Like giving you that rhythm, and then I sort of mixed in, and you're going to, you know, like the sort of backwards playing sounds as well. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it could easily be made into. Well, it is a track. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Artemiev was aware of those sorts of experiments that were happening yeah. in the sort of fifties and sixties as well. Because um, again, even we could just about pick it up, but like on the the low frequency, or the bass in the, the mm. tracks as well, it's adding as well. So the ten part of the tension is that the bass is coming a bit heavier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's getting it's getting a bit um, it's getting a lot warmer. So it's getting a, yeah, a remix of this probably be coming out soon. <laughs> <laughs> if you get licensing and everything. I mean the 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 rest of the um, sounds throughout the film, the other Artemia compositions, and they're also quite bassy. I think they're quite low frequency, yeah. aren't they? It's it's quite different from Stalker, which has this slightly more I don't know. Um, it's kind of a smoother kind of sound, and, and Solaris, it's, it's really, I mean, I was just listening to someone, I was making a playlist or something, it's, 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 there's a lot of rumbling, there's a lot of, yeah. like, that yeah. kind of um, fearfulness, I suppose, but it's very, it, maybe that's sort of too much of an easy thing to put onto bass as a, as a frequency, but it does have that sense of something rippling under the surface, but, oceanic sort of sound. But there's that sort of empty, literally in space, there's, there's a silence, yeah. so how to fill it you can put like low frequencies in uh, in cycles. It, some, you, it, it, it rises and falls, and then there's emptiness again. So you have that, that sense that there's an absence of a body. Mm. You know, so there is that sort of thing going on. In, and, I, I mean, I, I really like the sort of the feather touch of the, the sound design in places as well. I mean, that's that's maybe one of the sort of more overtly sort of striking scenes in the film but um you know the scenes when when kelvin has arrived on the, the mission and he's starting to realize what's happening that people on the ship or around the planet are seeing the, these apparitions that they can't account for usually of people who are long dead and you don't know who the character is yet but he just starts to see this woman you know through some of the kind of barely open doors and it's just these really kind of tiny sort of minimal like electronic chimes that every time he sees sees this woman pass by the, these chimes uh, yeah. play and of course you you then get this sort of link between the chimes and the the presence mm. um i mean he could have gone further with that really uh one of my favorite film soundtracks is uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Les Mépris. And what I really love about that is the way you have this, um, this central score by Georges Delarue, which is, is very, very distinctive. And every time the central couple in Les Mépris have an argument, that, um, 
that piece of music plays. And then it gets to the point where towards the end of the film, Goddard can just have the two characters sat in silence and the music will play and you just know from the music that they've drifted further apart and there's no need for any words. And it's a really astonishing piece of, of sound design. Um, and Tarkovsky goes for something slightly subtler, but you know, quite daring here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yes, I, I love that. I love that score as well for the Mipri. And I, I, I love the way that it's, it's so lush, it's so beautiful. And one thing that God does to kind of really not let you enjoy it too much is to cut, cut it in really weird places mm. as well. Like it doesn't, it never concludes or it concludes and it just, yeah, it cuts off mid phrase or, or whatever, which I think is really, I know, it's kind of really annoying, you know, mm. <laughs> that's the whole point. And it's really smart. Sam, I read something you, you wrote recently about silence. Um, yeah. in films and um, yeah not to sort of put you too much on the spot about that but it was it was about the way silence is is, is used in, in sort of various different ways and I, I felt I mean I, I wonder if there is a kind of Tarkovsky in silence is there and it, what is that because different different si yeah. silence means different things to different filmmakers I think yeah well, I think it can be really disturbing and, and actually the, it's, it's like it's actual complete silence isn't it at the beginning of that clip which is really, really rare because it's, it's kind of considered to be bad practice. You, you might think that something's gone wrong with the projection or uh, you know, there's some, some technical fault. But also it does, it, it's, you know, it's unnatural to have a complete silence in a film. Um, and he, yeah, I think he, 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 he plays with that really interestingly, like, you know, with these almost subliminal sounds that you feel sometimes. You don't even necessarily hear them, do you? And, um, so he, he kind of... He, he, it's almost like he colours the silence rather than, um, uh, you know, has things coming in and out of it more violently than... Because uh, at the beginning of the film, it's um, water, plants in the water. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, it, but it's, it's quite plated, the, the volume is low down, so you just about can hear the, the rippling of, of the water, then mm. it slowly sort of uh, builds up again. Yeah. So it's another way of, like, can you... You're seeing something, but you're not hearing the thing, or you're hearing something, but you're not seeing the thing. It's that sort of and reshifting. It's, it's it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that total silence is actually really eerie and sort of terrifying. Um, and the most calming effects do come from from just use of sort of natural sounds. I mean, that opening scene of Solaris that you mentioned has an incredible calmness to it. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of um, some of Yasujiro Ozu's films, which use sort of particularly sort of rain mm. um, and the, the sound of rainfall. He uses rain a lot in, this, in yeah. pieces again. It, yeah, absolutely. Like, that's what I meant by the, like using the elemental sort of keeps yeah. replaying or even like the sound. We were talking before, the rain in this one is a bit mad. It seems a bit weird. Yeah. But it's again, it's, it either works as a calming or another bridge. So, you know, to make you know that there is a different the shifting from the earth to another location yeah. again. It's interesting that you mentioned the elements, the elemental, because um, I don't know if you've seen Chris Marker's film about Tarkovsky, but mm. he actually says that very, that very thing. But how important the elements are to to the films, the you know, the water, the the earth, the mm. fire. There's a lot of fire yeah. as well, right? And yeah. and um, I mean, Marker doesn't talk about these things sonically. He's talking about it as a kind of visual and also like sort of metaphysical aspect of, of, of the films but he, he kind of traces all these really nice links between those things and how they appear together like in Mirror that it's mm. raining and then there's a fire you know um, and he, he connects it to Tarkovsky's religion actually he connects it to Orthodox Christianity and its relationship with nature I mean I, I don't know I mean I feel like I can't really comment on that ex exactly but it's an interesting idea nonetheless um, but yeah, there is this kind of uh, earthiness, like I think you you mentioned that. Mm. For the, there, there's a real like close connection with with those things yeah. that you know, um, very physical connection with those. And I think it really comes across in the sound because yeah. anyone can film some fire, but if it doesn't really sound like fire, you know. Well, that's I think it's interesting that you can play between the natural sounds and the electronic. Mm. They're having a conversation. They, they exist quite well together. And it, that's, that's why I like to, as a, as a practicing filmmaker or sound artist, it, it's, it legitimizes your one's practice. It says it's okay to do it. Yeah, so it's yeah, freeing yeah. up the, the, possible, the possibilities of how you can approach 
uh, a project or an, a series of ideas because it's been proven. Yeah. So like you can go to this and say, okay, this this guy's done it. Now how can you um, add to that, mm. or what's possible? Because mm. you don't there's not um, you don't have to fit a particular idea of cinema or a particular idea of our sound. It works in cinema as in I, the, mod, the American model or the Hollywood model. Mm -hmm. There are other models, there are other practices that can give you, uh, give you your own voice that would justify your own you know, engagement with, with sound and with sound and image anyway. And you actually used um, sounds from Tarkovsky's films in, in your installation with, with Johnny Comfort. Yeah. And so how, how did you, can you sort of talk us through that a little bit? Um, I wonder how you, how you went about it and what... We stood up, stayed up late at night working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we watched, yeah, we had... But no, I mean, I suppose, what, what was the thinking behind that, behind the project, and, what, and why, why Tarkovsky, and, you know, why... Because, why like I said, he's played a, um, um, a spectre that's been a part of our, our practice. Yeah. So is this paying homage to him in that, in that way, in the way right. that we can, which yeah. is, you know, making a piece of work. That says this is this is a bit, it's not the old picture, but it's part of the picture. It's a part of the journey. And it's not the completion of the journey. It's a, a, a letter. It's a tone. It's a word that mm. adds to a song, or adds to a, a poem, adds to um, a de a desire to continue to create. So it's it's, 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 it's one of the seven pillars. Then it's, it's a simple. It's one of the right. the um, that supports uh, a cultural practice. So we pay respect in the way that we do in making making a piece in the in the in the name of you know. Right. So it's even the logic would be to draw on his work, but reconstruct it in, in a way, in the you know in, in the same sort of way, but well, similar sort of way. So in in listening through the films and thinking about like how to how to use the sounds, I mean maybe this is a hard question to answer, but did did sort of things jump out at you, at you that you hadn't noticed before, because like, you were listening with a particular purpose to sample and to yeah. to extract? Is it like you're saying? But is it is a silence? Mm. It is a li li listening for those seemingly dead spaces where nothing seems to be going on. And that's the bit. Because you don't need to go for yeah, the noisy. No, you go for the subtlety yeah. and just yeah. calm it down, and let the, the the momentum pull you through. You know, it's not it's not it's not um, solely fixed on one one tone, one song, one bit to sort of give you the knockout punch. It's the it's the overall arc of the of the piece that takes it takes it through. Right. right. And there's lots of bits you can listen and find. That's why my, my imagery is simple, it's like the Lego bricks again. Each different block is a different colour that locks together and constructs, you know, it's, it's simple. Yeah, no, it's nice, it's the sort of idea of something that's modular because what's like really attractive about that idea always, I think, is it can be added to. Yeah. Right? So it kind of implies that something is not, is not finished. And you give value to each piece as yeah, you, as you choose it. and you, have, you add... Um, you rationalise its, 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 its quality, its weight, its substance, its, um, and then you listen to it and say, yeah, this works, this is good. Or, or you take it apart and start again and see, const construct something else, build something else out of those elements. It's, it is about selecting those elements and then finding a way of actually locking them together that works for you, or works for the film, or works, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, that's roughly what we do. Um, I think we might be a good time to move on to Sam's choice of clip because yeah. I was thinking while well, talk, we're talking about natural elements and recordings and, and representations of those and Sam's picked a clip from Andre Rublev that really gets right in there <laughs> in the natural elements um, and also looks at painting as well which I think actually I'd like to come back to as part of what you, what you were talking about so, so yeah maybe if we could um, watch the, the next clip um, so yeah this is from the 1966 film Andrew so, so Do you want to introduce it? Yeah, yeah. This is a massive spoiler, so if you, if you want to leave the room, um, <laughs> this is from the very end of Andrei Rublev, and it's, um, it's a film in eight, eight parts. He's the uh, protagonist. No, he's, he's not the protagonist of Andrei Rublev. He's, he's present through the film, um, but he's not always the, the, the main kind of actor within uh, each section. 
And at this point, he's taken a vow of silence and he's kind of in the background as a witness to the forging of a bell. Um, so it's, in a way, the main character in this sequence is um, Boriska, who's this uh, adolescent boy who's told everyone he's got the secret of forging a bell, which will actually sound. Um, he, you don't know whether he actually does know what he's doing. Uh, so the, the, they raise the bell, and uh, if, if the bell doesn't work, they're going to be beheaded, pretty much, I think, is the it's implication. High, so. high tension, <laughs> yes, <laughs> high stakes. So, that, yeah, that's the scenario. Yeah. Благословляется, освящается колокол сей, краплением воды сия священный, во имя Отца и Сына и Святого Духа. Аминь. Благословляется, освящается колокол сей, краплением воды сия священный, во имя Отца и Сына и Святого Духа. Аминь. Он какие у меня всем заправляют? Парла дыма стридопера. Ma non ti sembra un po' strano? Sono un po' tutti così. Guardatevi intorno. Dai, dai, tubino. через сам качнешь. Давай. Ма, chissà cosa ne salterà fuori da tutta questa baraonda. Tu cosa ne pensi? Secondo me non ne uscirà un bel niente. Chiedo scusa, eccellenza, ma io direi che voi cercate vanamente di prevenire gli avvenimenti. Su, via, dai un po' un'occhiata a tutta questa roba. Cosa ne dici di questi straccioni, di questa goffa impalcatura? Ma no, giuro su Maria Vergine che questa campana non suonerà. Ma non potrà affatto suonare. Vostra eccellenza vuol fare una scommessa. A me sembra che voi sottovalutiate la situazione senza via di scampo di questa gente. Di quelli cioè che hanno costruito questa campana. Mi devi scusare, ma io per ora non mi azzarderei a chiamare questo coso una campana. Eppure, vostra eccellenza, e si comprendono perfettamente che il gran principe staccherà loro la testa se questo aggeggio non suonerà. A giudicare dall'aspetto dell'imberbe si direbbe che è un po' emozionato da questa circostanza. Non ti pare? Vostra eccellenza. Ha sentito dire che il gran principe ha tagliato la testa a suo fratello? Sembra fossero gemelli. Uh -huh. Guardate che stupenda ragazza. Dio mio.
отец весь старый так и не передал секрета. Пумер так и не передал. Могилу утащил, жила рваная. Видишь, как получилось. Ну хорошо, ну чё ты? Вот и пойдем мы с тобой вместе. Ты колокола лить, я иконы писать. Пойдем в троицу. Пойдем вместе. Какой праздник для людей. Какую радость сотворила, еще плачет. Ну все. И все. Будет. Будет. Ну чего ты?
I mean, I, I, I suppose I, I chose that just because it's not, um, doesn't have that working relationship that he had with um, Artemiev, but I just think it's, so, it's such a masterful piece of filmmaking, the way it's constructed and the way it's been built up to through the film, because he worked with a more, um, I suppose, conventional composer for the score um, of Chinnikov, and in fact, that, that, that last section of the film, there's, there's no music before that point. Um, and there are various kind of foreshadowing sonically of what, what's going to happen. He has a, um, a kind of vision of his, his mentor, um, uh, the, another painter called Theophanes the Greek, where there are these cathedral bells ringing in the background. And then the episode after that, um, he, you know, there's a, there are bells ringing at the end of that sequence. And so all kind of, it feeds into this moment with the bell. And, and there's it, it, actually a bit before that where they raise the bell and the, the cranking of the ropes is this, this incredible piece of very intense sound design. It's a bit like in um, Rafifi when they, that long silent high sequence where they, turn, they ratchet these things around and it like literally ratchets up the tension and you can, they're pulling these ropes and you know, everything's turning and going up and you're kind of, uh, just kind of, your fingernails are gripping into things. Um, but there's just so many other details, like the, the two, there are these two Italian emissaries, you know, off to one side, chatting away in Italian, and it's never subtitled, and, um, it, you know, it reminds me of, like, a detail from a, a Renaissance, you know, crucifixion or something, you'll, in the background you'll see some, like, men, men at arms, you know, playing dice, um, oblivious to the fact that there's this kind of life and death um, scene playing out in front of them. Um, but just, yeah, just the, the tension and release that the... the the lack of music in that last sequence building up to when the, the bell actually rings. I just think it's amazing. Yeah, the sound of the, um, before the bell actually starts striking, the sound of the, what do you mm. call it, pendulum, whatever, so actually swinging is really, yeah. the clapping, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's such a great sound. It's, it's a bit like this, um, I can't remember who the composer is, but the, um, the microphone piece with this yeah, amp and the suspended. Steve Reich, yeah. Yeah, it's Steve Reich, the suspended, uh, suspended pendulum, pendulum music. Pendulum music, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, but just as, a, as an exercise in kind of tension and release, and then the way it goes into colour and the music comes flooding back, and yeah, I just think it's pretty remarkable. I think the, the sort of choreography of the music and the paintings is actually really stunning. In that, I mean, I've watched I've watched that film quite a few times, and, and I. I don't, it's, it sounds weird, but I often forget about that end bit, and it always yeah. surprises me. I'm like, oh wow, you know, and it's because I mean, I I was. Again, this is actually something I was, um, I'm taking from the Chris Marker film, but he mentions, I mean, in, in lots of Tarkovsky's films, he films a painting or paintings, and, and often in a film that would be kind of something that you might not do yourself as a director, you might just get someone, you know, it, it's done as a sort of informational sort of documentary rather than like a particularly creative thing, right? But he, he took great care in all his films to do it himself, and, and I think that, that, that yeah, there's sort of, the, the way that the music and the, the filming of the paintings is just, it's, I just think it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. It's, it's also the, 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 the music was composed for a battle scene which they then didn't shoot. Um, and he actually fell out with the composer because the, of Chinnikov was so annoyed that he <coughs> used it for something he hadn't written it for. Um, he then refused to do Solaris and that's why Artemiev ended up doing Solaris. Yeah, and um, I think Solaris and one or two of Tarkovsky's later films nod back to Andrei Rublev by including shots of paintings or figurines from from Rublev. And I, I, I get the feeling it was the film that was sort of closest to his heart, really. I mean, in fact, yeah, he made Solaris as he, that was like his commercial film. Basically, he couldn't get Andrei Rublev released. So he thought, oh, people like science fiction, I'll, I'll do a mainstream science fiction film and Solaris was the result and that paid for Andrew Rublev to be released I think not long after. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's such a sort of pivotal film for him, isn't it? I think it's a film that engages probably the most with with the idea of devotional mm. devotion and religion. But I think it does so in a way that's <coughs> I mean I, I yeah, I find really engrossing and not necessarily didactic, which sounds crazy when you think about it. It's a very you know, it's a it, it ends with all the paintings and, and it, it's but it but to me I mean it feels like it addresses the idea of devotion and history um, you know rather than it being explicitly like a, a Christian film I don't know yeah. if that if that's well, it's, it's, it's a really elegant way to work around having people 
you know, kind of acting that they're painting masterpieces as well. Because you, you don't see him really, you never see any of his work in the film, do you, until that very end mm -hmm. sequence. And, and just to reserve the, the, the colour stock for that payoff, I think, is really fantastic. I, th I think it, you know, you really see the influence of, of um, sort of 1930s sort of Soviet realist films, but the, the, the best end of that, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, Eisenstein's Alexander Nevsky, of course, with the famous Prokofiev score for the, the battle scene, and um, I think that looms large over Andrew Rublev, even though the, the scene you mentioned with the specifically written score didn't make it into the final cut. Um, so I think it's a film you can you can place in this you know very interesting Soviet tradition, but as you say, in a way that's a lot less didactic and a lot less sort of manipulative of the viewer, I think, than than some of the other works that preceded it. Yeah, I think in going really deep into the paintings as well, you have maybe an echo of, of, of kind of structuralist filmmaking, perhaps. Mm. Sort of really looking at the material, mm. you know. I wonder if that comes back to what you were saying about the sort of elemental earthiness. It's like the paintings are also like that. Yeah, the juxtaposition okay. between what you saw before, just the mud and yeah. the dirt, yeah. and then you end with like an ethereal voices and then the gold. So there's, so it, for me, it throws up that question of like, you're in the dirt. But you're making these, well, precious metal kind of pieces. Or, I mean, like, I don't know if it's gold leaf or, or it's gold, but it's the Christ figure. I think mm -hmm. that's so your devotional pieces of works are very um, rich, yeah. but in your but in your day to day living, is like you're still in the mud. So, you know, the other guys are on the horses and being not in the accident. And so it's, that's is that, that polar kind of environment. I think I guess. So, I just know he said that Jack's yeah, position. Yeah, but like, sure. artisans handling materials that they can't afford themselves yeah. on behalf mm. of their, kind yeah. of their uh, aristocratic patrons. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. well, the voices are powerful, because right? then you still can feel that low frequency yeah. rumble sort of coming through the, the, the piece again. It's like, and, uh, and also, what he does with the bells, after the, the bell has rung, the, what he does with um, the, you know, the layers of bells between mm. that and, and, the, and the painting sequence is really fantastic. They just, it just kind of becomes this textural wash. Yeah. It's not really, you're not really hearing the individual bells anymore, are you? It's just kind of a timbral uh, cloud, I guess. And what you say, um, Sam, about the, the idea of the artisans working with materials that they, they they're actually are controlled by someone else, you know, I think it's really... It's really interesting because sometimes I think you can kind of lose sight a little bit of the politics of, in Tarkovsky's films because they're so beautiful and they're so mystical and they're so, you know, there's this kind of height to them that, you know, you, they're, they're not like explicitly political in the way that some films are. And, and yet, you know, they do have this very deep sort of politics to them and especially in that, uh, that regard, what you're saying, that what it means to be an artist and to create and the kind of hierarchies that make that possible or impossible depending on who you are. Mm. And like, I don't know, that's something that... Yeah, well, I mean, I don't. Um, this might be a, a stretch, but I've wondered if the, the, the whole bell sequence is meant to be a, consciously not a bit of a metaphor for filmmaking, because uh, you know, there's that line about making a film is like you, you know, you're telling a joke. You have to record every syllable separately, and then try and piece it together and hope that you've still got the timing right. And <laughs> it's a bit like you know, they, they put all this work into the bell, and it's either going to work or it's not. They're not going to find out till the end. Um, and unfortunately, their lives are like depending on it. So. Yeah. Is that what filmmaking is like? It can be that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the idea that you're piecing together something that will be, that will be transcendent, I suppose, is, 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 is maybe romantic, but it's something that can be life or death, right? And I think that that's, it, it's sometimes really good to be reminded of, of, of that, you know, as, as artists as well, you know. Um. Yeah. <laughs> on that note um, so so hot like it's very hot yeah <laughs> um, I mean I think we could maybe finish finish up soon because it is boiling hot I'm sure you want to go out um, but would anyone like to would, it, would anyone like to ask any questions or say or have any comments or like to say anything at all or are you all just wilting <laughs> <laughs> there's someone at the back in the, oh, yeah, hey. in the stock clip you hear the French national anthem do you have a reason why? Do you want to understand why that might happen? But yeah. I think it happens twice. I yeah, think. I personally have no idea. Anyone? Yeah, I don't know. The, 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 there's the Marseille, there's Bolero, and mm. I, 
I think, it, I might be wrong, in the original story, isn't it meant to be a Western country? So I don't know whether he's deliberately, and it says our small country, I wouldn't, in the, the little bit of expository text at the beginning, yeah. I don't really think of Russia as being small. No. So I, I don't know whether it's, it's like an explicit Although attempt. Although Stalker's really shot in uh, Estonia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I went there last year, the, um, the, the big tower uh, that's in the zone, that's, that's in Tallinn. Um, yeah. which is a very small country. So um, that still doesn't really clear up the French yeah. anthem no. I mean, I think issue. I was always thinking of that as like just a kind of effect of like maybe a radio dial or kind of like also just kind of displacing it somehow so that you don't really know where you are. I mean, that seems like the most basic, but that's not really answering the question either. Um, but it's, it's, but the, it's the trains. Yeah. I'm only just thinking of this now, but the, so maybe there is like an ESP thing because the... Mm. The moving, um, the yeah, the moving glass yeah. on the table, which I can't do, but the girl in the film can do. Um, and you see her move it at the end. And I think you, you actually see that you see it, you see the glass moving across the table at the beginning as well. She's asleep, but I don't know. Maybe that's her as well. Maybe maybe it's her moving the glass, not the train. At the very it, beginning. Again, it's that internal external thing, isn't it? We don't know where the sound where the sound is coming from, and um, perhaps perhaps we're not supposed to know. I mean, yeah. No idea. <laughs> Sorry. Anyone else? Well, yeah, it's difficult to see, um, but I, I think it looks like we're probably all ready for a break. Um, but, we'll, you know, um, I'm sure we'll all sort of talk about it as we go. So I um, just want to say thank you very much to Juliet, to Sam, and to Trevor, and to Curzon um, and BFI, um, for putting and the Wire magazine, of course, as well, for putting this event on. And before I have to, I have to say, sorry, I have to say a couple of things on Curzon's behalf before um, before we go. I think I've said most of it. But one thing that is important um, is that uh, so this this event um, is made possible by um, national lottery funding, um, which means that we have to. Uh, fill in evaluation forms um, just to sort of talk, just to sort of tick boxes about your experience of it. Um, and so their forms are going to be handed out around about there um, by the door. So if, you, if you're on your way out and you feel like you've got enough energy to do it, um, please do fill in the forms. And uh, yeah, well, thanks once again for coming and uh, yeah, good night. <laughs> Cheers.